Thanks everybody for coming tonight. My name is Mark Frazier. Uh, I'm academic director at the India China Institute. I also teach the politics department here at the New School. Uh, we have a, a great audience tonight, I can see. Uh, many familiar faces, many new faces. Uh, and we have a very exciting program. I'm just going to uh, say a word of thanks to uh, our collaborators, our partners at Descent Magazine. Uh, this is, uh, I think, the, in recent years anyway, the third uh, such uh, public event collaboration that we've uh, conducted with the Senate, and, and thanks also to the person I'm about to introduce for making that collaboration possible. Uh, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, we had uh, a program on anti-corruption movements in China and India, and I think some of the strong men leaders we're talking about in Asia tonight uh, are in, in, in some ways uh, products of that anti-corruption uh, sentiment. And looking forward to hearing what, our, what each of our panelists has, has to say. Um, I really don't uh, need to introduce uh, the person whose name you see here. Uh, he, he needs no introduction, but I'll briefly say uh, that Jeff Wasserstrom is professor of history at UC Irvine, editorial, uh, and the editor of the Journal of Asian Studies on the editorial board, of course, of Descent Magazine, uh, author of five books on China, including most recently, uh, the 2013 second edition of China in the 21st century, what everyone needs to know, uh, and also Asia editor of the Los Angeles Review of Books. And to those of us who are in the Association for Asian Studies, we're having our meeting in Chicago next month, I have to also say that he's highly regarded in our organization as certainly a, a strongman leader. And <laughs> Corruption drive, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's really a pleasure to be back here. These events have been um, the, over the last three years of my favorite time because um, I learned so much from them by getting people that I want to hear talk about things I want to hear about, and it's a very special pleasure. And it's nice to see so many friends from so many different uh, parts of my professional life uh, in the audience. Um, and I want to just introduce people and ask the uh, first couple of questions and then have it be as conversational as possible. So our panelists, I just want to say a little bit about each of them, and I'll go in order from where I am, and maybe that will be where they can start by um, the, the order they can speak in. Um, first, Nina Khrushcheva, who is Associate Professor in the Graduate Program of International Affairs and the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs for the Milano School of International Affairs at the new school here. She's a senior fellow of the World Policy Institute, an editor of and contributor to Project Syndicate, a wonderful, um, very almost utopian effort to create a truly international public sphere that I had the pleasure of uh, writing for, and occasionally being rejected by. Her articles have appeared in Newsweek. Uh, never sent it to you, yes. The New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times. And she's the author of books such as 2014's The Lost Khrushchev, A Journey into the Gulag of the Russian Mind. She's also, as though uh, these various activities weren't enough, a curator of an exhibit. And tonight is the last night of this exhibit. So if we manage to rein ourselves in, we'll be done in time to go a block away to see that. It's a directly related exhibit that we didn't plan it that way. It's called Romancing True Power, D20. And it's about strongman leaders of various kinds, not just Asia by any means. It's held at the Sheila Aronson Design Center at 66 Fifth Avenue on the main floor. Next over to her, next to her is Sanjay Ruparelia, who is an assistant professor of political science at the New School here, a former fellow of the India China Institute, co sponsors. His research focuses on the politics of democracy, equality and development in the post-colonial world, with China as a focus, but also interest in post-Mao China. And he has an upcoming book, Divided We Govern, Coalition Politics in Modern India, which will be available this April through Hearst Publishers and Oxford University Press. He is also the co-editor of Understanding India's New Political Economy. Next over is Ross Perlin. And here we're moving, though we didn't plan this perfectly, from the new school, two new school participants, to two dissent contributors. Ross is an author, linguist, and contributor to Dissent Magazine, among other things. 
His book, The Intern Nation, How to Earn Nothing and Learn Little in the Brave New Economy, <laughs> great, great title, um, was published by Verso, Verso Books. And he's published on a, written on a wide range of topics, including he was a contributor to a special section on China called China's 99% uh, that came out spring before last. And very fittingly, given the 99% uh, part of that topic, his next piece for Descent Magazine will be a look at two Occupy movements, Occupy Wall Street and Occupy Central. And that will be coming out in the summer issue, but will be online well before that. He also played a collaborative role in a, um, a much anticipated book that's about to come out in March, which is Chen Guangcheng's um, memoir, Barefoot Lawyer. Next to him, rounding out uh, the session, is Alexis Dutton, professor of history at the University of Connecticut, specializing in modern, China, modern Japan, modern Korea, and international history. She has been a contributor to Descent Magazine more than once and is the author of two books, Troubled Apologies Among Japan, Korea, and the United States, published by Columbia University Press, and Japan's Colonization of Korea, Discourse and Power. She's, her current project is Islands, Empire, and Nation, a History of Modern Japan. So as a little bit of background to this panel, two things. One is that Alexis and I are going to be on a panel at the Association of Asian, for Asian Studies in March with a related theme of um, strong man leaders. And this grew out of the idea of trying to think of topical uh, issues in the news that we thought both a comparative and a more historical and um, scholarly perspective could help place in a different uh, light. And the thinking was that there were some homologies of certain sorts between people, leaders who had been emer emerging uh, in Asia and also in, in Russia, who shared certain kinds of traits that were not the ordinary ideological traits. If you thought in terms of left and right, if you thought in terms of the names of their parties, if you thought of the specific traditions they claimed to represent, they would have little or nothing in common. And in some traditions of political science, they wouldn't necessarily be brought together. And yet, in some ways, they seem to be combining ideas of getting things done, efficiency, modernization, and appeals to certain kinds of tradition that linked them and made them um, similar. So we thought it would be a, a, a stimulating thing to put people together who thought most about one or another of these um, figures. Um, so without further ado, my first question to all of them is to say something about how the current leader of the country they follow most closely is and isn't like um, his predecessors, and what it is we, we can think of as being distinctive about him. So, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very, very much. Um, and it's not just in Asia or Russia, I mean, we have uh, Erdogan in Turkey, and there's a lot of other leaders that are um, emerging as um, we would call them, or we call them democratic authoritarians, because they do convince the public that it's okay to give up freedoms because they're going to be protected, and for that they need elections, and they are going to be that good leader, uh, and we actually, in our the 20, the 20 exhibit, we have a whole bunch of leaders that are being united exactly as Jeff saying, like various concepts including fashion, art, doesn't necessarily politics, but uh, ultimately um, all dictatorial leaders or strongman leaders are alike. Um, and that's what, uh, something I'm going to talk about because Putin is this great example of a democratic authoritarian who was elected, has been elected three times, and that's the popular in Russia, no matter what. Uh, you can take over <coughs> parts of Ukraine, you can go into other countries, you can stand up under Merkel, Chancellor of, of Germany, for four hours, and then certainly so in the middle of the night, and yet he gets away with that. Um, I would like to read a quote from Putin, which explains his own view in many ways. I consider it to be my sacred duty to unite and unify the people of Russia, to rally citizens about clear aims and tasks, and to remember every day and every minute that we have one motherland, one people, and one future. So, you know, when you have this great nationalistic and motherland-centric quote, obviously 
then you don't speak only to the peoples of Russia, but you also speak to the peoples of Ukraine and Moldova and a lot of other countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union. Uh, one of the interesting, so Putin first is an imperialist, and we have to remember that. Russia is a partially uncollapsed empire, and this is very important for his definition. Uh, the Soviet Union was an empire, Russia remains a landlocked empire, and Putin feels that it's his job to be a reuniter of all Russians, of all Russian lands. His uh, uh, view is very favorable with the Russians generally. When you have a country of 11 time zones, you basically live in an imaginative world because you, you know when people go to bed, other people wake up, and so in some ways that imagined nationalism is a very important for the Russian land. And I must say, Russia is very specific in this because it takes almost all Eurasian continent. I mean, it takes a lot of space. 11, once again, 11 time zones. It's a geographical axiomoron. Uh, something to remember in defining Russia as is. Um, I was asked to think who he is most like. There's a lot of Tsars that he's like. Uh, or wants to be like, even the great comes to mind, you know, the sort of Russian Westerner, very important um, 18th century, there are other 19th century Tsars, you may not know them, so I'm not going to mention their names, most of them are Alexanders. Um, <laughs> Joseph Stalin of the 20th century, of course, the uh, general secretary of the Communist Party, also the knighter of lands, by the way, chopped off a lot of Eastern Europe and made it part of the communist world. Uh, so all these things are very important for Putin definition. Um, uh, that's something I was just talking about because for me it's very unusual to be on an Asian panel talking about Putin because I said we're a geographical oxymoron, but just a reminder, Putin is a man from St. Petersburg, Leningrad, and St. Petersburg borders on Finland, which is, I must say, very European. So that makes us even more bizarre, because on one hand we're Europe, on the other hand we're Asia, but we're not really Asia, we're what the West is not. So Russia never defines itself as Asia. What I notice, and this is not a comment on any Asian leaders in any way, or Asian perception, is that when Putin is not doing well by the Western standards, suddenly he's no longer Europe. When you read the New York Times, you can read Putin about Russia in Europe. When you read an Associated Press, it's in Europe, news of Europe. But suddenly, I'm on the panel talking about Putin as an Asian leader, because he doesn't act the right way right now. And it reminds me of when I was applying for graduate schools uh, in the United States many, many years ago. It was still the Soviet Union. Um, I was going for my GRE uh, exam, and I had to find a way to ship my exam somewhere. Uh, in Europe or the United States and in certain rules for various countries. And for now, I couldn't find my country. It's the Soviet Union. We're 11 time zones. I could not find a GRE space for that country. I finally found it in Asia. Because you know the Soviet Union is not capitalist, therefore it's not the right way, so it's going to be in Asia. Which I find really very interesting. And sort of one last thing I want to say uh, is that uh, yet, being Asia or not, Putin is very often co compared recently to Adolf Hitler, which is a European leader, is a strong man leader. So once again, it brings us back to the geographical oxymoron of Russia and that kind of unity of the East and the West, or disjointedness between the East and the West, and Putin does represent it. So when the West or the United States doesn't understand what Putin exactly doing, just remember 11 time zones, Eurasia, it's very difficult to understand. I mean, we get it, but it's very difficult for everybody else. Um, so a couple of last, last points that uh, we find, and I want to Sort of recognize uh, Yichin Wang, who was my beautiful research assistant who stole her from the India China Institute. Thank you very much, India China Institute. So we put together the exhibit in the journal, and we put together various facts that unite the readers. Um, uh, so Putin is five feet six, which is very important once again. You know, when you have a lot of time zones, but five feet six, five feet six. <laughs> It's a bit of a problem, so you kind of force your existence to other people. Uh, his net worth is $70 billion, 
Yeah. We are losing everything to sanctions. 70 billion is still good. Uh, his presidential palace, which we will see is very important to people like that, uh, is uh, his uh, palace has cost about over a billion dollars. By the way, United States of America had to just build a palace of meager, I think it's 600, 650 million. So even then, nobody's compared to us. Um, and uh, another thing, we can talk about it later, I think sports is also very important in defining strong power leaders. He's his martial arts, judo, ice hockey, skiing, swimming, and uh, as you know, very often he very chestably uh, horse back rides. <laughs> he's also very attractive to the audience to show how what it would be. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so I want to thank uh, Jeff and mm -hmm. the Sat Magazine for uh, yes. putting together this panel. Um, I have actually have spent quite a bit of time trying to think about uh, not just Narendra Modi, who I'll be speaking about, India's new Prime Minister, but actually all the figures we're looking at, not least because Narendra Modi himself is extremely interested in these leaders, as you may have seen from press coverage and uh, high-level visits that Xi Jinping and Shinzo Abe have made to India and, and preparations for new trips. So, uh, this first question, how do you understand Narendra Modi? He's an incredibly complex political personality. And I think um, the first thing to sort of uh, note about him, of course, is that he, his background is in uh, militant Hindu nationalism. He was, from a very young age, a member of the RSS, the Russia Spy and Seven Sun, which is the parent body of Hindu nationalism. And he came to uh, notoriety internationally when he was chief minister of the state of Gujarat in Western India uh, in 2002 when an anti-Muslim pogrom took place. Uh, many, many people uh, believed that he had, um, that he, had, he certainly failed to stop the pogrom. Uh, many critics accused him of abetting it. Um, he was ultimately cleared uh, by the Supreme Court, uh, not Supreme Court, the lower courts and a special judicial commission, but there's still many sort of accusations and critics about him. But the thing about him that's very important in this period is that uh, although he, he denied any wrongdoing, he was unabashedly, aggressively uh, a pro-Hindu leader. And in the years since then, he has very assiduously cultivated a new image. Uh, it's part of the old image, but he sort of emphasized it as a modernizer, as Jeff was saying. That somebody who is going to make India a strong, powerful country, uh, based on high economic growth and rapid industrialization and good governance. Um, and so one of the models that came about during the election last year, when he suddenly catapulted onto the scene, and that in itself is very important to understand because he was seen as a complete liability for the BJP, which is the Hindu Nationalist Party, to elect or to choose as prime ministerial candidate precisely because he was so controversial, precisely because of the stain of uh, what happened in Gujarat in 2002. And to be honest, most, many commentators, and I certainly felt the same when he was chosen, uh, thought that it was, a, it, was a, it was a suicidal move by the BJP, that there was no way that they would be able to, to capture the reins of power in Delhi. And what they did, or what Modi did, actually was quite extraordinary. In the span of 10 months uh, after he was chosen, he launched a campaign that I don't think India had ever seen. Uh, the way the media was galvanized, uh, the amount of money that was devoted by big business and capitalists who firmly backed in a way that they never have in Indian history, a single leader, um, was quite extraordinary. And the results complicated, well, we can get into a discussion why it turned out that way, but effectively Modi led the BJP to a stunning parliamentary majority in May 2014. And to put it in context, it was the first single party majority government that India has seen since 1984. <coughs> so since 1989, India's had the largest coalition governments in the world. Uh, and suddenly, Modi was able to, to win a decisive, what seemed like a decisive mandate in parliament. And, and so a, a lot has been written since then about uh, Modi trying to understand him. And I think what's interesting about him is precisely this sort of twofold image. <coughs> he is a, a Hindu nationalist leader. Uh, and he's unabashed about that. 
but he has also tried to cultivate and project this industry of modernization. So one of the key slogans during his campaign was that he was going to champion and promote minimum government, maximum governance. And clearly, of course, all the political scientists since then have been trying to understand what does this really mean, and I'll say in a moment what it means, or what it seems to have meant so far. Um, and you can see this sort of modernizing image uh, in his actual dress. I mean, Indian politicians, like politicians everywhere, cultivate a lot of their politics through fashion, how they dress. But he's, he's quite um, careful about it. So on the one hand, you'll see a Rolex watch. You'll see Montblanc pants. You'll see now the infamous suit that he wore with Barack Obama, which had his name stitched all the way down, which uh, was such a public relations disaster, he had to auction it off just last week. Um, for $700,000 to a diamond merchant in Western Gujarat. Um, but at the same time, he also wears, when he is in India, um, a signature kurta, which is a tunic worn in India, which is half sleeve to show that Modi is somebody who rolls up his sleeve, doesn't need to roll them up. He, he's always working, he's trying to get things done. And the image that he was really portraying was of this incredibly muscular, uh, aggressive leader. Right. And that's what, in the vacuum that had happened in Indian politics over the last three, four years, where there was a paralysis at the heart of government between Manmohan Singh, uh, a very sort of amiable, but diffident, technocratic prime minister, and Sonia Gandhi, the power behind the throne, which had led to paralysis uh, in New Delhi, within the Congress party, in cabinet. Uh, Modi was there championing his 56-inch chest. <coughs> Just to show, I mean, he wasn't bearing his chest like Vladimir Putin, but he had a 56 inch chest. And he was going to stand up to China. And he was going to court Japan because he wanted to show that India wouldn't be pushed around anymore. Um, and he was also going to, uh, in a sense, live up to the promise that Manmohan Singh, who was the architect uh, in the early 90s of India's first liberal reforms, was going to live up to the promise of making India a truly industrial country that would finally match and eventually overtake China. Right? So one of the slogans since he's come to the office has been make in India. Right? Because India hasn't had this manufacturing revolution like China has had. And it's a serious issue, of course. It's a failing of previous governments um, because there's been a lack of employment creation uh, in the country. Um, so that's something about him. He's a terrific communicator at mass rallies, and of a kind that in his generation really hasn't been seen. And so the figure that people often talk to, compare him to, uh, ironically, because he's been uh, such a vociferous critic of the Congress party, which has dominated Indian politics since 47, is Indira Gandhi of the 1970s. And in many ways, what's so striking is since he's come to office, and I'll just sort of end with these few remarks, uh, he's actually taken a lot of pages out of her book and updated them for the times. So one of the things that's very striking is how much he's personified the power of the BJP in himself. During the campaign, he purged many rivals in the party quite ruthlessly. Um, so a lot of towering figures in the party for the last 30, 40 years was literally shunted aside. The most important would have been Lal Krishna Madhvani, who was the hawk of the BJP, led the Ram Janma Bhumi movement in the 80s and 90s, just dispatched. You know, he's basically an old man whose time has come and gone, uh, and others as well. Modi, uh, since he's come to power, has a centralized power in the Prime Minister's office in a way that we haven't seen since Indira Gandhi. So many cabinet ministers are basically uh, without much work. Um, uh, every decision goes to the PMO. He, he and his staff talk directly to the senior bureau, bureau, bureaucrats in government. So you have a parliamentary cabinet system, but for all intents and purposes, the cabinet has become a little bit of a rubber stamp on it. Uh, another aspect which has become very controversial is, despite having a majority in the lower house of parliament, a number of controversial bills have been pushed through by executive ordinance, which is permitted by the Indian constitution uh, within a specific amount of time. And they have to do with issues that are controversial that were passed by the last government. Most importantly, the acquisition of land by the state, uh, increasing FDI and insurance and coals and so on. Um, we'll get more into some of those details. So what's interesting is that even though it's won this unprecedented mandate since 1984, there's a trying to push through controversial bills by executive ordinance. Um, and the other fact that's really striking is how little engagement there is with the press. So there's no official press officer. 
there are very few press conferences. Um, but Moni has one of the largest followings I read uh, on the web somewhere early today. Of all the leaders in the world, he's the third most popular in terms of how many people follow him on Twitter. And I'm also one of his Twitter followers. So <laughs> the same. And so you get communication, but it's one direction. Um, and in the, in the midst of all this, of course, a lot of the more extreme elements of the Hindu nationalists, as you may have read in the last seven, eight months, have begun to do what they had done in the past, target religious minorities, Muslims and Christians, try to, uh, in a sense, intimidate critics uh, in the public sphere. Um, there has been an, uh, a report that has come out by the, by the intelligence bureau saying that environmental NGOs are anti-developmental and a threat to India's prospects. Now, this is not a BJP plot. This is actually right, a, a part of the state that even the previous government uh, sections of it were, were amenable to. But what's very interesting and concerning about what's happened is precisely that, that there's a great concentration and centralization and personification of power. Um, and that's and that's worrying for people who are concerned about the about democracy in India. But that's also probably um, where this hope lies, because as what happened in the 1970s, there's been so much uh, centralization of power that there's actually someone to blame when things start to go wrong. Uh, and that will be the Prime Minister in the wrong. And the election you may have heard about in Delhi just two weeks ago, where a new populist party, the Am Admi Party, the Common Man Party, shocked the BJP by sweeping the assembly, suddenly it's galvanized the opposition again. And so the next year is going to be very important to see uh, how, how the BJP responds, how the Prime Minister responds. Before I do a quick, intense dive into Xi Jinping, China's strongman, sometimes known as Xi Dada, Big Daddy Xi, mm -hmm. uh, in China, uh, I want to step, take a quick half step back and read a quote. Um, At the end of the era of Western colonialism, and despite the introduction of parliamentary governments of various kinds, the political leaders of the Orient are still greatly attracted by a bureaucratic managerial policy which keeps the state supremely strong and the non-bureaucratic and private sector of society supremely weak. Um, that's from Carl Bidfogel, written in 1958, uh, one of the sort of most famous uh, kind of voices of the Oriental despotism theory, which, which, which is really sort of traceable in various Western thinkers back to, back to Aristotle and Herodotus. As long as Westerners and Europeans have been talking about uh, Asia, they've been talking about strongmen. Um, and this goes on with Gibbon and Weber and Marx, who spoke of an Asiatic mode of production. Um, and, that's just something I think to keep in mind throughout the discussion. Uh, and on the one hand, you know, as as, as Nina mentioned, um, you know, there's there's a danger that this can obscure strongmen elsewhere, whether it's Erdogan in Turkey or whether it's Orban in Hungary, uh, possibly a more, more global phenomenon in general. And and secondly, I would also suggest that um, you know maybe we'll get a chance to look at the sort of lines of influence between our various strongmen that we're that we're speaking about. Uh, and, and in fact, perhaps the more recent kind of origins of, you know, rather than obviously some primordial kind of thing here that that that, that they both and others might have uh, might have looked to, but um, the sort of origin uh, in more recent developments uh, of this kind of strongman phenomenon. Uh, on the one hand, an evolving response to to capitalism, to sort of deeper penetration of capital in these societies, um, and it's. Familiar kind of uh, phenomenon that as the market is dissolving traditional ties, you need these sort of forms of solidarity um, to kind of keep things going uh, and appeals to tradition or supposed tradition. And on the other hand, you have uh, a response to the West and, and to the, the power of the United States in a sense that you need to be strong enough to kind of stand up to that. That would be particularly, I think, the, the Chinese case and maybe in the Indian case, as, as, uh, as Sanjay was saying. Uh, you might have a response, a kind of intra-Asian imperial rivalry situation where India is, 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 is looking towards China. So these lines of influence and uh, you know, the extent to which China has been a model now for the last, at least the fall of the Soviet Union, a kind of uh, a supposedly kind of successful case of, uh, of sort of going your own, your own road, a non-Western road. Um, those are all kind of questions that I, I hope we can, we can explore. Uh, but quickly, a little bit about, about Xi. It's a good time to talk about Xi Jinping. He has recently released, after a little more than two years in office, he's now sort of 
has his crystallized philosophy uh, as every uh, good leader of uh, the Communist Party must at some point kind of come up with their, their theory, whether it's the four modernizations of Deng Xiaoping uh, or the three represents uh, of, uh, of Jiang Zemin. Uh, we now have the four comprehensives uh, and uh, these are now being promulgated uh, and I think there is one telling thing here. Uh, I mean, the, the, the four comprehensives are you know, I think what you would expect in some way, they're a crystallization of, of what has been sort of reigning orthodoxy since Deng Xiaoping. Comprehensively build a moderately prosperous society, and that's a, the term Xiaokang Shui in Chinese that has a particular valence. Uh, comprehensively deepen reform, comprehensively govern the nation according to the law, and comprehensively be strict in governing the party to crack down on corruption. Um, but I think it's actually the adverb, comprehensively, that's probably most telling here. Uh, and empty as it, as it may be, uh, I think it does point to the comprehensive way in which, in which Xi Jinping uh, is shaping Chinese society. And there's no debate about whether he's a strong man. The only debate now is whether he's the most powerful Chinese leader since Deng Xiaoping or, or since Mao Zedong. Um, and, um, you know, his impact can be felt in various, various sectors of society. Um, and, you know, in general, the note has been uh, on what is talked about as leftism in the Chinese context, or a kind of neo-Maoism, um, what is, is a more anti-Western <coughs> bent, uh, whether that means um, crackdowns on, 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 on Western-sponsored non nonprofit activity or civil society, uh, or secret documents that are leaked showing that uh, Western influences at universities are to be curtailed, um, and, and perhaps foremost, a, a nationalistic bent as well. Um, and uh, the crackdown on corruption with over 50 high-level uh, Communist Party figures, uh, one way or another, uh, censured, imprisoned, etc., worse, uh, has been probably the most high-profile element of, of, Xi's, of Xi's reign so far. Uh, but in terms of the sort of soft power side, uh, there's also quite a lot going on as well, whether it's the four comprehensives, whether it's Xi's sort of almost star status uh, in comparison to his predecessor, Hu Jintao, and, and indeed to Jiang Zemin as well. Uh, in the case of Hu Jintao, who was, uh, I think I could almost borrow Sanjay's words and refer to him as an amiable but diffident technocrat. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, that, 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 that led, in, in the case of Hu Jintao, to a lot of discussion in his early years as to whether he was still being dominated by, by Jiang Zemin behind the scenes. You haven't heard those discussions in the, the two years of, of Xi Jinping's reign. Um, I think the only questions are sort of looking forward um, and wondering whether what, what has been called by one observer the consultative uh, Leninism uh, of the Chinese system where you have a nine-person uh, standing committee of the, uh, of the Politburo uh, that it would seem to be kind of more oligarchic really than strongman driven where cults of personality since Mao were uh, explicitly kind of frowned upon um, whether that system will be shaken uh, and whether uh, in more ways than one she will follow Putin whom he admires, who he professes to admire and who is wildly popular in, in China, perhaps more popular than any other world leader uh, and change the patterns of succession uh, when his sort of uh, customary 10 years come up in, um, in 2022 uh, whether he'll then, you know, kind of retreat as Putin did and sort of come out back behind the scenes, whether he'll have a more controlling influence in whoever comes next, uh, and, you know, whether indeed the, the sort of status quo as it's been for almost 30 years in China is being shaken by the, uh, by the power that she has accumulated, first of, first of all, uh, as sort of an anointed one, uh, when, he kind of, when he came in as, a, as somebody who was a princeling, um, to use a term, from the kind of uh, from the China side, uh, somebody who had impeccable revolu revolutionary credentials, his father having fought alongside Mao from from sort of the early days, um, having had a sort of perfect biography, um, but then also methodically assembling power and uh, and, and and tossing rivals aside. Um, so it's a lot more that can be said, but but I'll but I'll stop there um, and uh, and hope we can sort of tie all these tie all these threads together. I think I have the least fun leader listening to you. I don't, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know what he looks like without his.
shirt on, I don't want to know what other <laughs> is. But I have no idea what his chest size is. I don't think he's any good at sports at all, and maybe that's part of what I'll get to. But I, um, I want to pick up on Ross's notice of context for all these leaders. And one thing that's really important to understand about Japan today is um, a social sense of a withering uh, a withering Japan. Um, and so whether this is a hyper-capitalist moment of blowback against the withering state, I'm not sure. I wouldn't go there. Um, but I, I would like to raise a very interesting essay that's available in English on Mark Selden's website. He's back there. He can hand out Japan Focus uh, website information for you. But it written in 2005 by a former Ministry of Justice official named Sakanaka. It's got the unfortunate name of Immigration Battleground Diary. But it sets the context. Japan today is 127-ish million people. Sakenaka, a longtime Ministry of Justice official, in particularly responsible for racial discrimination and about ethnic Koreans, um, wrote a very, very powerful critique of, the, of Japan, um, saying that if Japan maintained its current very strict immigration um, rules that by 2050 there would be 80 million people and they would, it would be a pleasant standard of living for the 80 million people there with good social services and perhaps the military could help out in humanitarian ways with earthquakes. This is again 2005 for context. Um, or Japan could drop immediately all its immigration restrictions and become a robust nation by 2050 of 180 million people with a very proactive world, world avenging military. What we have in Abe, who is a man who wants the world avenging military without changing immigration laws. So it's, he's a paradox from the get go. Um, he wants some very weird thing called proactive pacifism. Uh, which involves Japan's world-class military out on the world stage. Very few Japanese people see Japan's world-class military out on the world stage. Many Japanese understand that there is a strong military in Japan. It became part of the social scene in the wake of the 2011 earthquake and tsunami, that is to say tanks. So uh, self-defense force troops tanks were rolling through these towns helping out men in uniform, women in uniform, in the context of Japanese villages for the first time since 1945. And this was a remarkable social you know, transforming event. So what, what I'm going to get to with Abe revolves around the military. I want to put that over there for a second, though. Because Japan has one time zone. And this is an important thing to think about. Japan should not have one time zone as far as time zones go, because on the very same day in late May at 3.30 in the morning, in the islands disputed with Russia, um, and why Russia and Japan remain at war from World War II, the sun rises at 3.30. On the very same day, the islands closest to Taiwan, the sun comes up at around 8. And it's under the Japanese Empire that Japan centralizes time. It also managed to put Korea in that time zone, which does upset Koreans when you mention this to them. And they see, well, why don't we get out of the time zone? Well, no, you're kind of on world time there. But it's really interesting. I seriously Google a map of time zones and look at just north of Japan and Russia. They're about three hours off on the same day when the sun rises, because the Russians figured it out. They don't want to be part of that world anymore. But the Japanese are still, I just raise it because it's the empire. It's all about the legacy of empire that is embodied in Mr. Abe. How that comes out, I'm not a personal fan of psychohistory, although I think it's a lot of fun as a pedagogical technique. Um, but with Abe, it's impossible not to do it because he invokes his grandfather, Kishi, uh, a man who was suspected of Class A war crimes. Um, he was not. Um, he was arrested. He was kept in Sugamo prison. Uh, the Americans uh, exonerated him, and he became prime minister, a very strong prime minister. Kishi was a very strong prime minister. Abe regularly discusses sitting on his grandfather's knee to the extent that uh, in the equivalent of the State of the Union address of Japan on February 12th, Abe began by saying, "We're going. I'm going to get Japan back. 
And <coughs> the question is, where has Japan been and from whom is he going to get it back? And that comes to the one national holiday that Abe has put into play, which is National Sovereignty Day. April 28th, which is the date that Japan became a sovereign nation again in 1952, with the uh, San Francisco Treaty going into effect, the occupation was officially over. Um, this, of course, infuriated Okinawans. Okinawans did not regain sovereignty, although who they want to be part of <laughs> remains to be seen, and we can come to that. Okinawa, of course, was an American-occupied area until 1972. Mr. Abe does not care about what Okinawans think or want, and we come to that too. Abe's invocation of his grandfather is something to pay more attention to in the context of another leader in Japan, and I really wish I were a playwright, because Hirohito's grandson, the crown prince, Naruhito, gave a very interesting set of remarks on his 55th birthday this week, and I'm not sure if you caught them in the press, but I would Google them, because it's very irregular for the imperial household to be allowed to comment on active duty politics, as it were. And Naruhito urged uh, the Japan to recognize what had happened in World War II in terms of bad things that happened. Um, so we have one man with a very strong ghost of a grandfather, Hirohito, in the imperial palace, and right around the corner we have the more human leader in Mr. Abe, who would overturn uh, the end of World War II to the extent that is going to be increasingly clear this 70th anniversary. Abe himself has said that he does not see that the uh, 14 Class A war criminals, as judged, should be considered criminal because in domestic Japanese law, they would not have been considered criminal. Now, this is very different from going back and analyzing in an international context the question of Victor's justice. This is Abe seeking the earlier thesis of liberating Asia, which brings me to Jeff's question. How is Abe different from the leaders that came before him? Um, Abe is different from the leaders before him not simply because he's from the Liberal Democrat Party and the three that preceded him were from the Democratic Party of Japan. In 2009, when Hatoyama won by a real landslide, and it was pretty awesome, uh, for the first time in 55 years, the Democrats, there was going to be a change in one party rule effectively in Japan. Hatoyama wanted to take Japan back to Asia. He ran on a platform that was inclusive of, unfortunately, he picked the 1930s expression of a greater East Asia. Many pointed out that, that maybe he would want to come up with some new language. But he wanted to get Japan back in Asia, in China, in Korea, in Mongolia, and not through the US definition of it. And there are a couple of studies in the works right now but it was an astonishing moment of watching Washington not know what to do. And it wasn't that the Japan handlers in the alliance system didn't have contacts in this party versus the LDP. Of course they did. What they didn't have was preparation for what to do with the leader of Japan talking about, wait a minute, you mean you might not need the American military? And that's really what the context that precedes Abe is. These are not three prime ministers who said, US troops out now, not at all. But the opening of a discussion of how many troops, what are we going to do with these bases, was for the first time articulated in 2009, among other things. Then we also had a prime minister in Kan Naoto, who, whatever one thinks, I don't think another world leader could have done better in the triple disasters. I mean, really, earthquake, tsunami, three nuclear reactors, and meltdown near your capital. He resigned in August. I won't get too detail-oriented, but he was also pressured by the United States into a corner to get Japan back online, despite the plebiscite in Tokyo saying, we want to go offline. The pressure for Japan to renuclearize forced on um, out. Then we have Noda, who sort of blends us back into a friendliness with Washington. Abe came 
came back in not by winning. The way Japan's politics works is he won the presidency of his party. And then he was elected as prime minister in, in 2002. So he's back also his third term now in 2015 to bring Japan back. Which brings me to the question of, is he a strongman? Or is he a strongman puppet? Because different from the three people we've been hearing about, this is a man who is determined to change a core principle of post-1945, 1947 Japan, which is Japan's pacifist constitution, Article 9. And he has promised left, right, and center to deliver on this to Washington. And without Washington's backing, and without these promises, which are being seen now on the front lines in Okinawa more clearly than anywhere else, I'm not sure he would be able to be in this class of strongman, and not just because you don't see him without his shirt on, but that this is an unusual level of patronage that is discussed not in terms of clientelism or puppet very often, but perhaps should be more, more discussed in those terms than just as a leader of a sovereign state in Northeast Asia able to do things. Uh, and I think that the way we see this uh, is two is twofold in recent events. One comes about uh, with the horrible executions of the two Japanese uh, by ISIS, in particular the journalist. The journalist Goto Kenji was uh, arguably the best product of what post-war open Japanese society can afford to the world. An independent journalist because of his Japanese citizenship, able to go places that a lot of other people aren't able to go to, because Japan doesn't have overseas troops fighting wars, we can get into the conversation about who pays for what differently, but Goto Kenji himself wrote about this a lot. Part of his privilege of being Japanese was he knew he could go to war zones and document the horrors of war in ways others couldn't precisely because of his passport. That he was able to do that and bring that out, and then his execution gets spun immediately by Abe as justification for why Japan needs to send its troops overseas, um, is arguably how Abe will use anything to get Japan's military on the status of a world-class overseas proactive fighting war kind of military. At the same time, there's a lot of blowback, and I think we can come to that in the question session um, in terms of people standing up publicly denouncing this act of Abe's. But also, I want to end my comments with what's going on inside Japan in terms of how he is a strongman. Because it's, there's the world stage, is he a puppet, is he a strongman? Inside Japan, he is proving his strongman nature in a very anti-Asian way, in a way that has torn asunder decades of delicately achieved relations with neighboring countries predicated on acceptance, really neutral acceptance of certain histories having happened. But this is where we circle back to the ghost of the grandfather and trying to resurrect a glorious end or a glorious definition of Japan's war in Asia, which Abe, on record, has used the terms liberation of Asia. You just, interestingly, that document has disappeared from the Diet Library, it was 1994. Um, several people have gone looking for it, and we can't find it anymore, but some of us have Xerox copies. Anyway, what he's done um, in Recent, in the recent year, most specifically, is seen in uh, just shredding relations with South Korea. And he's done that by using one of the best known histories of atrocity in the 20th century, the, the so-called comfort women, the uh, women who suffered in a system of organized state-sponsored sexual slavery that ranges anywhere, and I'm saying this because the numbers are still to be known, anywhere between roughly 50,000 up to 200,000 women, girls, young men from throughout Asia, a preponderance from Korea. Indonesia, Philippines, China, Australia, um, these, are, these are known histories. What does Abe do last spring? 
he authorizes something called a review of the so-called Kono Statement. The so-called Kono Statement came about in 1992 and was Japan's first uh, acknowledgement that the awful history had happened. It is a very politically massaged diplomatic, South Korean diplomats, Japanese diplomats, massaged statement that you know, activists found completely lacking in honesty at the time and you know, watery. But it has held things together and it's a baseline from which many of us have worked to build relations about historical events. Abe decided that his, his uh, supporters could review the history of how this happened to the extent that they wouldn't, he, Abe, would not change the words, he would uphold the statement, but in the process of doing this review, opened up uh, slander against Korean diplomats that was so base that by the end of the process, it became possible <coughs> under Abe's rule to say the most <coughs> astonishingly overtly racist things about Korean in Japan and anywhere. And so the blowback from that has really set off uh, a very negative beginning to, shall we say, the year uh, of 70th uh, memories. And um, I'll leave it at that because I think that he is within Japan proving his, his strong man abilities by being anti-Asian outside Japan. He is proving his strong man abilities by defining himself so completely at U.S. bidding that um, it seems that he does not want to have anything to do at all with Asia. Yeah, I want to go to, to questions. I just want to summarize a couple of things that have come out. First is self-criticism in Chinese tradition. For the title of the panel, I think, to make it a more positive and geographically open-minded thing, what unites these figures is their colorful, charismatic, determined, personalistic, eclectic, Eurasian modernizers who care about tradition and want to project an image of not being pushed around by Western enemies or allies. So that would be the new one. And I think we left out a, I was, I'm glad Korea came in because I was feeling bad we left out Korea. Korea is one thing that's pulling actually Putin toward Asia. He's inviting him to uh, Moscow to mark the 70th anniversary of the end of the war. And also, Korea, South Korea arguably would have had the one strong woman leader with ties to a strong man of the past who could have been uh, brought in. I wanted to hope in the questions, if we can get some questions also about the other side, which is dissent within the periods of this. And by the way, Dissent Magazine up there um, has a lot of things that are about America, but in fact, Dissent Magazine, one of the nice things here, is it's been moving to internationalize and to bring Asia as well as other parts of the world in. So that's one of the um, nice things about these kinds of collaborations. And Kavya Ashok, who's here, an associate editor, is one of the people who is um, helping with that tribe. And we encourage more people to think about dissent as a global phenomenon. The one comment I would have about dissent is there was a period, a lot of these leaders are being described as re-engaging with the effort to be charismatic at some level, or to be strong personality figures, rather than just drab technocrats. You have a certain period when there were a lot of drab technocrats around these areas, and one of the things that happened then was the only charismatic figures associated with these places were the dissidents. If you think about Burma, there was no face of the Burmese, of the Myanmar government, but there was on some Su Ti. And when you had Hu Jintao showing up in some settings, and the shadow, uh, the figure that, that China didn't want anybody to focus on, the Dalai Lama, oozing charisma, you have something, uh, so that would be another kind of balance there. Finally, time zones. China only has one, and that's the great anomaly. So, We'll see. If there really was a China model, if it was the China model influencing Putin, rather than perhaps the Putin model uh, influencing Xi, you might, well, we can watch how many time zones they have. <laughs> there are either questions. Okay, well, well, I wouldn't have said democratic authoritarianism. I feel what unites Putin and Xi, and maybe a little bit Modi and less so Abe, but certainly the first two. The doctrine is Marxist capitalism. 
a capitalist economy, but looking forward to the day when all people think alike. And in the case of Russia, it turns out to be very easy to unite capitalism and Christianity, because both of them look forward to the day when salvation will come, and everybody will be the same, and everybody will be saved. And this can go together with capitalism. In the case of India, religion is also a part, I mean, as faith united with capitalism, but not a faith that looks forward to the day when everybody is alive. And in the case of Japan, I guess it's simply nationalism and capitalism. But the thing about Marxism that people don't get is that it is a faith and it demands faith. And it has to demand people all thinking alike, no matter how much. And capitalism doesn't contradict Marx's words at all. Anybody want to take a stand? Pick up uh, one theme there from George. Um, Xi Jinping seems to view his historical role as preventing what happened in, in the Soviet Union from happening to the Chinese Communist Party. Um, there's just sort of bits and pieces of evidence, but it seems that he has, you know, a, uh, a bit of a fixation on, on Gorbachev and the way that Gorbachev sort of wasn't, you know, man enough, at least according to one report of how he sort of put it, um, to kind of hold the line. Um, and that, you know, that through force of personality, she will, 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 will do this, that he will prevent this from, from happening and seems to therefore believe in something of a of a great man theory of, of, of history and uh, and think that through the sheer force of personality he can he can hold things together uh, and I think that's informing a lot of uh, you know what he's allowing relatively minute steps by global standards but by Chinese standards fairly significant steps towards having more of a, of a cult of personality or more centralization on him as a single figure. I found out how much nationalism cost two years ago. It's $26 million, and that's cheap, because you're exactly right. What's nationalism and capitalism in Japan, if you've got a tanking economy, you buy the islands. And when Noda nationalized the islands by buying them for $26 million, he put a price tag on what could unify Japan. And that is being revealed very interestingly in Abenomics, which the Abenomics, uh, which was supposed to, which is why he got voted in, which has not restructured the economy as promised. It's made the rich richer, and you know, oh, really, you're kind of thing. But, um, but you can sell nationalism in the right? It's like, yeah, so exactly. Yeah, question. Um, I was happy that you brought up as a part, and I was wondering what you asked about Alexis to um, yeah. talk a little bit about as a part of design, it's, it's such a focus on um, as, as possibly a strong woman. I mean, not just her lineage, but also um, uh, de the deregistration of the uh, opposition party recently, the fact that the intelligence agency was meddling in electoral affairs, um, or looking back to her father's. Um, development policies as possibly some sort of development policy that the world can benefit from or, um, or such. And, and reciprocally on the other side of that, um, <coughs> the opposition in the Republic of Korea um, seems to be a bit of a mess. Um, you had the Democratic Party, which has gone through nine million iterations. Now they call themselves with the New Alliance for New Politics and Alliance for Democracy. And they had aligned with, the, with um, a former tech, popular tech guy. And that's not working out. What's going on? I mean, she's her popularity ratings have been going down since she's been elected, but the opposition doesn't seem to be able to pull themselves together. I mean, at any point in time, this seems like it would be, given that South Korea is maybe one of say tradition of dissent. Um, you would think that, that, given the circumstances, this would be the time for the opposition to really sort of come together. I agree, and that's true in Japan as well. And thank you for all the things that we're not hearing about South Korea because the neighbor, well, the two neighbors are, are overshadowing um, President Park. Um, the the Sewol, the ferry disaster, is actually quite instructive insofar as um, her indecision for quite some time um, allowed 
the, the, the terrible disaster that killed all of the junior high school children for being trapped on board. And this um, really revealed so much of the cronyism that's, that really her base um, in, in um, very stark relief, her inability to stem the, the overwhelming um, national, well, looked at differently, if she had announced a week of national mourning, rather than allowing it to grow into things that turned, uh, you know, that sort of decimated uh, the economy of coastal towns, that um, led to opposition being seen as people demanding free college education for the surviving siblings of the disaster victims. That is to say, she's allowed almost a year of this ferry to dominate uh, the discussion of Korean political scene, revealing arguably not only is she not a strong leader, but that uh, she might not actually be able to hold on to anything if Abe weren't allowing such a nationalist response to buoy under her. Interestingly, the one comment she had made about relations with Japan, with which she's had very good relations um, prior to being president, the one thing she essentially said was, don't talk about the country. And it's almost as if Abe handed her the ability to just stay in power when, as you rightly say, everything should be tearing her down. But this is where South Korea, in the middle of larger things, I think more will be revealed in terms of her attempting um, dialogue with Pyongyang uh, without Washington. And I think that could be more of a test than anything else. Um, this one way also to get a window on South Korea at the moment will come this weekend. The uh, March 1st independence anniversary is, is South Korea's State of the Union address in many ways. Um, last year she was very firm. It came about during the Kono review, the Japan uh, initiated review. Um, I think if she uses that again, it will be further indication that she's just sort of buying time. But you're right, without actively organized um, uh, opposition, it does seem to be just a sort of five-year nothing period. Um, and I think, unfortunately, uh, it will only strengthen her party base. I had one question I wanted to ask about Modi and Putin, because I've just been always curious about the much that's been made about the Chinese soft power initiatives, which I think are often designed in part to engage with uh, overseas, overseas populations of ethnic Chinese to re-engage with the, the homeland country. And that does seem to be something that Modi tried, has been trying quite directly with things like the Madison Square visit. I'm not sure if it's something that Putin cares about or could care about. Whether there are efforts to play to maybe more generally audiences beyond the country itself, or if simply maintaining power at home is the, is the constant concern. So I'm just wondering for those two. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's an important question. I think the, the EJP, the internationalists, have for a very long time uh, reported uh, support abroad in the diaspora. And uh, it was after the, the Chinese began particularly to try to recruit people back to China and investment, but the, I think it was a very explicit uh, attempt to copy bits of that policy. So one of the executive ordinances that Modi just pushed through was a new uh, card called a PIO card. Um, in India, the love acronym is important in the United Nations. Um, so a person of Indian origin, I'm a person of Indian origin, so I can apply for this card, and that means I can visit India forever, uh, without getting visas and so on. And they have all these different programs and plans. But I think that also says something a lot. When we talk about Asia, and I think, of course, if the algebra here in the United States, and that, of course, is the official pivot through all these countries, is that it's very, I think, important to see. I don't know these, I don't know this figure is exactly right, but I remember just hearing last week in a conversation with uh, Thasma, the Vesh Kapoor, who has a, a new book coming out on Indians in America, uh, where he told me something 
incredible, which was since 2000, uh, there have been as many Indians who have emigrated to the United States as all Asians before 2000. So the demographics in the United States have changed. I think you see it, right? You turn on the TV and you see members of the administration and the press. And there's sort of a visibility of that. So I think both for financial reasons and just larger demographic shifts, um, that's something that's really striking. The one other thing I just would say just to, to bounce off what's been said is I think one thing that's very striking when I think of the, the four countries we're talking about is you say well, under what context do these strong leaders come about and what are they channeling? So you mentioned you know, a withering Japan. Uh, and China, of course, is hardly one, but has this issue of the demographic shift and the slowdown in the economy, and India has it too. But what's very striking in India's case, I don't know much about the Russian demographics, is that it is a predominantly young country. Uh, and the frustration that you see in India is that frustration of a young population, increasingly formally educated, looking for economic opportunities. And what Modi has done, what he did incredibly well, was to capture that. Right? He was saying that there needs to be greater economic opportunities. And so it's, it's a sense of frustration of the possibilities that have not been fully realized. And I think that actually that context is something very important to understand why he is gaining so much popularity. Uh, thank you. Um, actually, that is exactly my point on democratic authoritarianism, is that when, when Putin came in in 2000, he said there was a vacuum of governance, exactly what you were describing in Modi's case, uh, and I am going to bring, I am a trap technocrat that is going to bring order to this society where you will have 11 time zones, and we're very proud of this. Uh, you have 11 time zones, but the road from one time zone doesn't meet another road that comes from another time zone. So you actually have from one region to another, but there is no direct roads. So he said, I'm going to make all these connections, uh, and I'm going to do it with the help of my trust and security forces, because another thing to remember about Putin, he's a um, colonel of the KGB. And he does run that system. It's a very KGB. It doesn't believe in any legal formulas. I mean, if you want to take Crimea, we're just going to take Crimea, because, you know, who's KGB responsible uh, to? Uh, so this thing's very important, but they do come because Yeltsin's period after um, allegedly the Soviet Union lost the Cold War, we didn't have to thank Gorbachev for that, actually I'm thanking Gorbachev for that, with no irony, um, that uh, now he's going to come in as that strong man and drop technocrat and technocrat, technocrat Russia to, into, into this great prosperity. So there is actually, there's a lot of soft power going on. But the problem with Putin is that being a drab technocrat and trying to be first the West, because that's what he wanted to be. He wanted to be a partner of the West, but then the West really didn't take him on the terms that he wanted, which is equal terms. So he's going to become the Tsar of the East. So he's going to show everybody how to, to be what he is. Um, so he was a James Bond. He tried to be James Bond of contemporary Russia, but he really didn't do that well, we did well for a while, and then it didn't work out as well as he thought. So there is a lot of soft power going on, but unlike the Soviet soft power, because also, I mean, you only remember being the Cold War people, you remember only the bad things, but, you know, the Soviet Union actually did build chess clubs in India, and in fact, your chess champion is the one who is grateful to the Soviets for doing that. Uh, factories, there was a, a Patrice Lumumba University in Moscow, a lot of people were educated. So there was a lot of things like that. And the Soviet Union knew, knew exactly how to balance out bombs, ballet, and all these other edu educational uh, and other opportunities. I think the problem with Putin is that he's very self-centric, and therefore he hasn't decided what the soft power is. So a lot of it is about culture, but we're not interested in ballet as much as we used to. You know, Brothers Karamazov is really not as appealing as it once was. And so they kind of they keep talking about this culture, but they, it's not that interesting because they really have to come up, and that's what Chinese are so good at, the Twitter thing, the, the toy thing. And we haven't gotten there yet. And in that, you know, the Italians have pizza and olive oil. And we're still very much balancing the 20th century of, of traditional greatness. So in some ways, Putin actually fits into this great description of of a political science definition of weak states is that he is a strong leader, but he's a leader of a weak state. 
and weak because weak states have weak liberties. And I think all of the states, that, most of the states we've been describing, really suffer from that disease. They're weak states with weak liberties, and they have a strong leader to make up for that. But ultimately, for example, in the case of Putin, who asked about the opposition, it was strong, now it's not strong, but it's, it hasn't gone anywhere. And I'm maybe wrongly expecting any day now that somebody was going to take him out. That's why he's so reliant on the military at this point. Yeah. Um, regarding these appeals to religion, Russian Orthodoxy on Putin's part, the very fact that the BJP is Hindu nationalist, even Confucianism to some extent, Erdogan, you know, clearly, we're reviving Ottoman glory. How much of that is authoritarian sort of juice for nationalism? And how much of it is perhaps a more genuine reaction against global capitalism, the kind of vacuity, the dissolution of old norms? Um, to what extent is it deep-seated, or to what extent is it just a manipulative thing that that these guys, to some extent, are playing with. I'm trying to gauge it, and I don't know, of course, it differs radically in each case. I don't know if any of you would have I think, just very quickly by Russia, I think it's both, as, as, you, as you mentioned. And as one hand, it's, uh, uh, it is that, and, and for example, last year, right before uh, Russia has a Sochi Olympics, so you can invite people in, but you have a very strict anti-gay law at the same time. So, I mean, it seems almost counterintuitive. But the point is that we are not going to be, and it's already mentioned, it's what it's anti-West. I mean, the West is decadent, it brings us wars in Iraq and then denies that it has any responsibility and whatnot. So we're not going to do this. Uh, so I think partially it's that. Uh, but also with I mean with Russian Orthodoxy, it's 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 an important because you mentioned uh, Marxist capitalism. The thing about Marxism is it was a theory. It actually, I mean, that's what's so interesting about Russia. It is a slightly retarded half European, half North European nation that instead of going through all these levels of development and evolution, you go through this and you're like, okay, let's just do it very quickly. Let's just have a revolution, move it on. Uh, so they, they put it in. But Russia is a communal country. It has always been a communal country. The whole idea of orthodoxy is we are part of the communal idea of New Jerusalem where this table, if we build it, is going to collapse. But our unity is not. And so when you have communism, it's not, it's not really um, uh, in vain that they share the same roots. So it's a communal and communal. And so we get, now we got back to that. Russia got back to that. But Putin being a KGB guy, he looks for ideology to make it not only a belief system, but also a function of security forces. And that's what I think makes Russian Christianity a bit off because it's also an arm of a KGB. The, the constitutional changes that are proposed for Japan, what hits the press, of course, is dropping the, um, the prescription against Japanese troops abroad, against Japan having the military. What's really happening <laughs> is an attempt to, uh, the, when you read the proposed draft, the distinction between the separation of church and state is out. Uh, Abe is very much tied with an organization that seeks to reintroduce so-called state Shinto, that is to say the, the, the old school, uh, to bring it back, that is our core national definition. Um, the, he is the supreme leader, that is the preferred translation of an organization called the Nippon Kaigi, um, which not only believes in the liberation of Asia thesis, the history is the least of the problems, uh, believes very much in the 1930s doctrines of uh, purity, essential Japanese-ness. These are things that um, do demand a much broader international um, discussion because what's interesting is while Yasukuni, the notorious shrine to war dead in Tokyo, hits the press, um, even if he doesn't go because Washington told him it would wreck relations and that's not so good, he does very much annually attend and make substantial personal financial contribution to an organ to a different shrine, which is at the core of this resurgence of attempting to bring back state Shinto. This is also where we haven't heard from the imperial family overtly, 
but this is where palace intrigue in Japan is far more interesting than Abe having um, dinner tomorrow night with Prince William. It is the Japan uh, royal family that would obviously be in the crosshairs of this, and this matters specifically because there are published uh, journal reports right now on the stands in Tokyo saying that the current crown prince is not fit to rule. This is not about his dad, um, the son of Hirohito, but the grandson. He's not fit to rule, and besides, he has a daughter. Let's go with number two son, who is also a member of the Nippon Kaihi of bringing state Shinto back, um, who magically, 17 years after his older children were born, managed to produce a son and the heir to the throne, Hisahito. So this sounds very unusual, but it actually is going on. Um, this is where what happens in succession um, will be interesting in about 2022, I think. So, so Ross, you've written about religion in China from different perspectives. Just a brief, yeah, a brief read on the Chinese situation. I think, to some extent, any specific appeals to Confucianism or Buddhism uh, or even Maoism um, are maybe relatively on the surface here. Um, but I think what goes deeper and what's unchanging is is this sense of Chinese characteristics, of a distinctly Chinese road that is you know, counterposed to, to, to the Western model. Um, Western ideas can be described, are being, are being described as spiritual pollution and being combated as, as such, although within limits, because there's clearly a sense that the West still represents the, you know, the sort of technological and economic and scientific model that, that needs to be looked to. Um, but um, I think, to some extent, she represents a kind of crystallization of a feeling which uh, I think got a particular sort of boost in 2008 in China uh, when the economies of the world, the Western world, were collapsing uh, and the Chinese economy kept on, just sort of kept on going, kept on going quite well in the sense of that we don't, we don't need the West the way the way we once did, um, maybe there can be a sort of divergence. Um, and so I think there's, there's a continual drive, and, and, and she is definitely representing it, of appealing to various layers, various often seemingly incompatible layers of the Chinese tradition of the 5,000 years of history, whether that's again Maoism, Confucianism, various things that don't easily fit together as well. And I, I think any specific appeals to one or another of them are not, are not quite the point right now. Uh, so much as an ongoing attempt to sort of fill, fill a void, I, I think is right, the, the sort of centrifugal forces of, of Chinese society under, um, under capitalism, under increasing levels of capitalism, to sort of, for Xi to be a sort of figure at the center of it, for some sense of distinctive Chineseness, a distinctly Chinese road, uh, to be sort of maintained as the central concept. There's a question uh, Yeah, I think it was uh, interesting what Alexis said about uh, Shinzo obvious uh, continued references to his uh, political ancestry and sort of use the fact that he comes from a politically prominent family to his advantage, respecting his image. And uh, I think it's actually because of the the opposite is almost true, that he's, he's not from a political dynasty, and he's uh, it's kind of leverage the fact that he embodies a more like, classical, like, rags to riches story to his advantage. And I was wondering what you guys make of that contrast, and, like, what it says about leaders themselves and about the culture is that kind of view strong language. I'm not sure I got the question. No, the question was the contrast between playing on being in a, of a powerful lineage, which to some extent both Abe and Xi make a, make a lot of, versus Modi emphasizing the coming from nowhere, and to some extent Putin also being from nowhere. But I think it's interesting also if we, one of the things that came out was there can be that kind of fictive ancestors that you connect with powerfully. And often it's sort of one generation back, the kind of thing, the way that, you know, this kind of channeling of the spirit of Eve done before the you skip over the immediate predecessor and go back, um, with Putin going back to the czars, but also to some extent to, to Stalin. Uh, so anyway, that. And I don't know if Modi, is, you mentioned Modi is sometimes compared to Indira Gandhi's which wouldn't be the direct connection, but it would be more like a nostalgia for something a couple of generations back that can be imagined as representing 
a kind of strength that's been lacking. So I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think that's where Modi really stands out. Because in fact, he would use the word princeling in Hindi, right? But he was targeting Rahul Gandhi. But that's the princeling. And, and in that sense, I think I would probably describe the characterization a little bit. But I, mean, I think in India's case, it's not that there's a lack of liberties that led to Modi's rise. In fact, if anything, the last government was pushed through the most progressive welfare measures and transparency and accountability measures that India had ever seen. And in comparative terms, you know, some of these laws are quite unprecedented, the right to information law, for instance, which actually got uh, Xu Jiong, uh, I mean, a lot of, a lot of the arguments that he was making about the constitution and the government was really inspired by, uh, I think, partly what we was seeing in India and RTI. So I think the difference here is, it's about, in Modi's case, it's, it's, some of it's about uh, the, the power of money in elections, you know this uh, too well in the United States, and that's a big problem in India, election finance. And I think, but it has to do with the context of rising, rapidly rising expectations. So remember, India's have had its highest rate of growth, and then suddenly it declined in the last two years before the election. Right, it literally cut in half from about 10 percent to five, and that was the frustration. And then the wave of corruption. The uh, Anu Hazari India against corruption movement. What Modi did masterfully was to channel that, right, backed by massive money. Um, but I think what's interesting about him is, in a sense, you know, the connection that they made, that they were trying to make with Barack Obama when he visited, was was that, right? Mm -hmm. Here's somebody who does not come from a princely family of any type. Does not come from a political lineage. She comes from a family, which is the Hindu nationalist family, the son of Baba. Right, which is how it's translated. So I think he's quite distinctive. And in that sense, I think that's why lots of people I've met would say, why are you supportive of Modi? I said, yes. So I said, why are you supporting Modi? I said, you know, the fact that we could produce a Modi, and then you have all these arguments about his Hindu you know, politics. But they want to bracket that. And they say, okay, well, he's somebody that this democracy has produced. So, you know, how, how should we deal with that? And that's a big issue that we haven't touched upon all of what dissent. Because one of the big issues, of course, is about why is it the case in, in a period of rapidly rising inequality is that these figures come up? China is a perfect case, and India as well. And this is where the question of where does the opposition now come from it is a vital question. We've had lots of questions on Marxism and communism. In India's <coughs> communists have suffered their worst fate. And uh, there have been lots of shortcomings about communist ideology and strategy in India. But that voice is critically lacking now. And you know, there's a new party that's trying to fill that space. But that's a big, it's a big question in that sense. Actually, let's try to get a few more questions and then go around for one final set of comments to all of them. Yeah. Okay, uh, first of all, thanks to the panel. Uh, this has been a remarkably informative uh, <coughs> session. Um, and your vivid portraits of the four people uh, provoke a lot of comparative uh, questions. And my question is about global strategy. So you've mentioned uh, the imperial uh, references, the imperial pretensions, that, uh, but am I right in thinking that China is the only of these four countries that really has a global strategy? The others have near abroad strategies. <laughs> That's true. They want to move outside their borders. But um, China has a plan. Uh, and it's largely soft, um, uh, and it's very effective. Uh, and I don't know if I got you right when you said that there was the, the, the sort of soft power was to, to reach out to the uh, to the Chinese. That's part of my interpretation. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but the that's fact that, that you know Americans can go study in China for free. Um, I mean, that was very highly developed and, and very. Um, uh, as well as, of course, the economic the building roads and, and uh, uh, train uh, railroads in, uh, in Africa, etc. So, is that right? Does that mean anything? All right, let's get more questions and then do a final wrap-up here. Yeah. I think it's kind of more in response to your commentary. I was wondering, just since, um, including Russia as well, but I think all, like, the United States and all of these share many types of the same problems where they are somewhat of a democracy but they're very much controlled more and more by corporations or a select few corporations and how much will that really um, affect
affect what Modi and, and we already know how Putin operates um, on that level. But Modi, who is he really at the end of the day? What what will his policies be long term wise with that factored in? Um, my question is about climate change, I and mean, I think few issues expose the shortcomings of like accrued nationalism more than climate change is and will continue to do. And I'm curious what we should expect from these leaders on that issue, both in the conference coming up later this year and in the in the years that follow. Excellent. And we've got two more questions. Thank you. Explain it all. Three more questions. <laughs> Short questions. Yeah. I'm going through Kissinger's world order. And some of the problems of uh, more harmonious states and work with the UN and NGO communities. And to what extent do you think uh, that these strong leaders are trying to hold the territorial nations together? And how do you develop healthy, happy individuals, families, and societies, local to global? Aren't these issues of identity and character and don't we need some type of more universal way to? engage each other constructively versus destructively and see reality in each other. I'm struck that the uh, the unifying uh, principle of all all of the uh, of the talks uh, seems to be essentially to be nationalism. This is what this is what a strong leader <coughs> essentially is about. Uh, but it seems to me we come away without having gone very far in nationalism for what. Um, whether we take whether we take inequality rampant inequality in each of these societies uh, as a fundamental uh, challenge, or whether we take the uh, the question of strong leaders in an international context, uh, it seems to me we're left without much of a clarity about where any of these are going. Alexis has raised a very important question in thinking about how they strength is this strength that in fact ends by reifying American power uh, in the region, uh, and strength subordinated to American power. Uh, I think we should be asking that this kind of question for each of the countries we're talking about in the context of, on the one hand, the decline of American hegemony on a global scale, uh, but a continuing power of the United States as uh, a dominant world power. So China, for example, um, Somebody was saying perhaps China alone has a global vision, um, but China is also deeply implicated within American power. Uh, propping up the dollar is the best example we have of this. Allows us to do all these things on a world scale. So how do we, in fact, move from strong leader to the big picture of what's happening regionally as well as, as globally? I can't wait to hear them all tie this together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's one point about what century. And, I'm sorry, comparing Modi's style and that of Indira Gandhi. I will, I'm surprised that he did not take it, he did not learn anything from Indira Gandhi because it was her dictatorial style that brought about her downfall. And at that time, it was BJP that was at the forefront of the anti emergency movement. Uh, and what uh, ruling through executive order, I don't know whether he took a cue from. Obama or Obama could forgive the president. All right. Let's do quickly pick a one place to dive in and go in reverse orders. I have to do one really I have to do two really quickly on climate change. Disaster from Abe. Today, uh, the tent city that had been at the Ministry of Justice protesting nuclear power was handed a $100,000 fine. Japan will go back online in addition to having three reactors in meltdown. That's not helping anything. Um, to Mark's million dollar question, to tie into the global strategy one, and you'll be pleased to know Mr. Abe won the Kissinger Prize last year at a, and that at a luncheon at the Pierre said to everybody, call me a right-wing nationalist if you want to. I mean, he actually said it. Like, it was a positive thing to say. And his lunch must have been really good. Um, <laughs> I didn't gather that from Kissinger. I, I, it was, yeah. I didn't get that. <laughs> thought it was a compliment. So anyway, um, there's a deep, deep paradox uh, in Abe, which is fascinating, because the core faction that brought him into power that has renamed itself, the Sosei Nippon, uh, is a profoundly anti-American uh, platform. And it's available. Uh, 
I, I do know that people in Washington read Japanese. Uh, it would qualify under Patriot Act as something to arrest people for, actually. It is that specifically anti-American. Thus, what's fascinating to me about Abe is he is so hell-bent on getting this militarized Japan that he is taking advantage of precisely what he sees honestly in his own writings as the, the very power that has sullied and tarnished and wrecked Japan's identity, he'll do it as long as he gets to send his troops abroad the way they had been. That said, there's no strategy. It might be to stand on a rock that nobody wants to live on. Why does he want to send troops overseas? Because in his mind, that honestly, and this is in his book, Beautiful Japan, in his writings as a junior parliamentarian in 1994 also, it would justify that what his grandfather had done in establishing the Manchurian Manchukuo, he was, he was the architect in many ways of establishing Manchuria, was good. Abe is not a, Abe is not a deep thinker. I'll put it that way. I won't say he's not complex. He's very complex, and I certainly would not question his intelligence. That said, what he wants is to bring back Japan. The back part that he wants to bring back is this notion of a glorious Japan that to him was defined in 1934-ish, which is, um, it's not going to happen, no, but right now, the United States sees Japan, again, as an aircraft carrier, let's get North Korea, and let's ner make the Chinese nervous. Is it also issues of honor or pride? All right, we've got a bunch of other questions. Let's keep going. <laughs> I think it, it may be the case that of the powers represented here, China has um, the greatest ability to do, or is developing the greatest ability to do power projection around the world, um, and that the idea of a sort of brick block uh, really is, is, you know, is instead a kind of veil for Asia being a realm of classic great power politics in the you know, Kissinger tradition. Um, but I think there's an irony here to sort of have a moment about China's dissent, um, that the real sort of sites of dissent in the last two years of, of Xi's rule have been China's near abroad, uh, which is having a lot of trouble controlling, arguably. Uh, that's Hong Kong and Taiwan. Hong Kong with Occupy Central, Taiwan with the Sunflower Movement, less reported on. Uh, in both cases, you see perhaps not a direct response to, to Xi's policy or who Xi is, um, but, um, but instead, more broadly, a reaction to the sense that China's political liberalization promised uh, really in the late 1970s by Deng Xiaoping has never arrived, only economic reform has, uh, and that um, the fear that, that Hong Kong and Taiwan will lose their democracies and be sort of swallowed up in, swallowed up in that. Um, and so those have been the sites of dissent because that's where dissent can, can happen. And I think Xi's methods are only exacerbating the problem and making clear that uh, there's not going to be any move towards political reform. That hope used to be sort of periodically aired with each, you know, each new leader, each new term, but uh, I think that hope has, has, has largely died in those places. And then just to sort of tie in one theme I think here as well, um, part of what has no real effect I think in Taiwan and Hong Kong, but has had a great deal of effect in terms of Xi's power in mainland China, and I think has been an element of all the, all the strong men here, certainly uh, going, going west, uh, is the sense that corruption is this huge issue that we've recently emerged in, in, you know, in these places from periods of deep corruption. And that corruption may be tied to perceptions around capitalism and sort of misuses of the, of the flows of money that are coming in, uh, and that these strong men can come in and sort of stanch the flow of, 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 so of corruption. Uh, and in Taiwan and Hong Kong, that has had, you know, that kind of rhetoric doesn't have much effect, but that is a key underpinning of Xi's legitimacy. And it's probably what he's best known for, uh, and perhaps a tie between various various strong men. But that appeal to to corruption. Uh, and just sort of, we're going to stamp out corruption. Uh, I think is itself worth 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 questioning because uh, it does look back then a generation back to some purer time, supposedly when corruption didn't exist, and that will be restored by these strong men who are appealing to you know, more prim primordial values. Yeah, I think what Ross said about corruption and inequality is absolutely central for India too, and it's in that sense that although Modi uh, wants to advance economic liberalization further. He's not going to do the bidding of 
on capital in India. In fact, there's already a sense of disappointment amongst Titans of industry that he hasn't pushed through enough. So belatedly, there are these ordinances. And I think this is where India's democratic system does really matter, because the fact is he has to face elections. And uh, the majority of the population still, for instance, on the land bill, everyone's going to watch it. The session's opening on Monday, the next parliamentary session. And they're going to have to try to ratify these um, attempts to weaken the land bill, which is going to give greater, uh, uh, basically require the government to gain consent of 70 to 80% of all stakeholders before they forcibly acquire land. Now, how is he going to deal with that? The party's already backpedaling because as of yesterday, there have been demonstrations in Delhi uh, by movements that organized farmers that are saying you have to protect this land more. But I think the big question that uh, Mark Feldman asked about US power, I think, is central. And again, here, I think what's interesting about Modi in India more generally, I do think there's continuity here. There is a strategic pragmatism uh, which comes through. And you can see it if you just think of the press in the United States over the last several years after the civil nuclear deal. Right? There's a US defense pact with India. There's a civil nuclear deal. The Americans said, we want now India to be a strategic partner. And we want India to open up its borders to US capital. What happened? A lot of frustration. And Obama now has gone there and tried to seal that pact. But I think what's interesting about India and under Modi, you can see it. He reaches out to Abe because he wants more investment, but he immediately reaches out to Xi Jinping and says, I also want your money too. Um, and he'll go everywhere. <laughs> you know? So I think there's a pragmatism there. And the desire there is really a, multi is a multipolarity. And so you see India shifting on climate change. When it suits its interest to be locked with China, it will. But as soon as it says, hang on a minute, you're imposing cuts on China, but China's twice as big as us. It produces far more carbon emissions. Its GDP per capita is much higher. So suddenly we're not with China. So I think, I think that's the, and that's a deep continuity, I do think, in India's sort of strategic community, uh, whether it's Modi or Manmohan Singh or somebody else. It is the sphere's desire to maintain its independence. Um, and in that sense, in a curious, ironic way, and there's a long, deep legacy of, of Nehruvian, of Nehruvianism. Mm -hmm. uh, even Thank you. Um, actually, the same thing goes for Putin, although, of course, there's nothing uh, narrow in it. But uh, since Putin decided that he's firmly anti-West, he is using multipolarity in all these other terms. So he's trying to upstage Barack Obama when he goes to various countries. He goes to India first, he goes to China, he meets with uh, El Sisi of Egypt, uh, and, and so on. So he's basically trying, as I mentioned, trying to be the Tsar of the non-Western world. Uh, this actually brings me to uh, Alexis' point that um, Abe wants to have uh, this glorious image. He wants that Japan of, of some glory of the, of the past. Same thing goes for Putin. I mean, he really wants to bring back the Russian glory, whatever that means. Once again, he's from St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg is a Western city, was built by Peter the Great. So that's where Putin's interests are. But in some ways, he's also a third-way Germany or imitation of Germany around World War I, when Germany was strong but was no longer strong and was very upset that it's not being recognized by other great powers. So that what I keep saying is that Russia is actually not an um, Asian country, but Russia what the West is not, which makes it firmly Western country, but the un-West. That's how I define it. Because it's not a Confucian civilization, it's not an Indian Hindu civilization, it's not a Japanese empire. It's just we define ourselves from what the West is not. Uh, which makes it very interesting for Putin and goes to the strategy question of you know, this China is the only one that has global strategy. Uh, Russians are not great strategists, never happened. We're too big for that. I mean, why do we need a strategy? We have a lot of time zones. But <laughs> we're really great tacticians because when you fight out territories that are very convenient to you this time, look at us. We just do it better than anybody. And the Japanese know that very well. Uh, so it's something that Putin is very good at. And his strategy, which is very tactical, judo, I mean, judo is his sports, by the way, very important. That is his sports, he's looking for weaknesses. <laughs> is that his strategy is the negative strategy. I mean, if China wants the soft power, for him it's a negative. It's just destabilize near abroad Europe, 
the West. So that idea of America that is now weakened for him is great. So he's saying, you know what? You're no longer the victor of the Cold War. Whatever those superpowers were before, I am one of them. Or if you're not going to recognize me as such, I am going to really wreak <coughs> havoc in anything that you try to do. And that's what he's, that's what Russia is. Basically, it's what the West is not, and that's how we're going to continue. Thank you. Thanks again to the panelists, to all of you for the stimulating questions, and to the India-China Institute and to Scent Magazine for the collaboration.